Hey everyone, Mr. Fransky here. Uh, today we're going to do, this is really 6.6b um, in the pre-calc book, uh, which is just talking about the Moab's theorem. So yesterday we kind of did an intro with trig form of complex numbers, um, and today we're going to be able to actually put that to use in the Moab's theorem. So we'll start off with a warm-up here of just some stuff we learned yesterday. Uh, so first of all, if we have z1, z2, and z3, notice z1 and z2 are given in trig form, our r times cosine theta plus i sine theta, and z3 is given in standard form a plus bi. So a few things here I want you to try, so why don't you pause the video, give these a shot, and then we'll try them together. All right, let's give these a shot. So first thing I want to do is change z1 to standard form a plus bi. So to do that, I just need to do cosine of 90 and uh, sine of 90, and then just distribute in the 6. So cosine of 90, well, let's think about our unit circle. It's right up here. Cosine there is 0. Sine is 1. So I have 6 times 0 plus i times 1, which is just going to be 6i. Okay, It's on the y-axis, so it's purely imaginary. right? There's no real part to that at all. Next up, they want us to change z3 to trig form, r cosine theta plus i sine theta. So I'm going to make a little graph of that. So we're at negative root 2, positive root 2. Right there. Okay, so we're going to think about our r value there. r is the square root of a squared plus b squared, which is the square root of 2 plus 2 in this case. It's the square root of 4, which is 2. Okay, so we got r. And theta, I'm just going to think about this one. So x and y, notice, are the same value. x is negative 2, uh, root, root 2, y is positive root 2, so we're going to be one of the 45s there. I think that's going to be um, 135 degrees. All right, 45 degrees past 90. So we're going to have uh, r, cosine, r times cosine theta plus i sine theta, so we're going to have 2 times cosine 135 degrees plus i sine 135 degrees. Yesterday we used radians a lot. Um, degrees, radians doesn't really make a difference. In this problem, they're already using degrees, so I'm just going to keep using degrees. But if you wanted to use radians for that, it would be what? 3 pi over 4? Yeah. All right. Moving right along. So notice that you wrote it right over here, so we have uh, we have that trig form, just so we can do these a little bit easier. So z1, z2, so we learned this formula yesterday. So if you want to multiply two things, you just multiply the uh, r values in the front. That's 48. And then you add the degrees, or the, uh, the the thetas together, right? So we have cosine of 90 and 135 would be 225, plus i sine of 225. Now, if you want to change this to a plus bi form, that would be 48 times, so let's see, 225, that's the 45 down here. So cosine and sine are both negative root 2 over 2 there. So negative root 2 over 2, plus i times negative root 2 over 2. And if you distribute them, you would have 24, negative 24 root 2, um, minus 24 root 2i. I didn't ask for an a plus bi form, so if you left it in trig form, that's fine. z3 over z2. So we're going to do, uh, looks like, 2 over 8. When you divide, you subtract. So we have cosine of 0 plus i sine of 0. Cosine and sine at 0, cosine is 1, sine is 0, so this is actually just 1 fourth. Because sine is 0, so the imaginary part goes away. Interestingly, when you divide two complex numbers, sometimes you get um, a real number. Cool. All right, so let's learn Demov. So here's Demov's theorem. Demov's theorem has to do with taking powers of complex numbers. So if z is some number in trig form, r times cosine theta plus i sine theta, so it's important that we are in trig form here. Okay, so we got ourselves in trig form here. Let's think about z squared. So that's just z times z. So what would that be? That would be r times r times cosine of theta plus theta plus i sine of theta plus theta. Let's simplify that a little bit. So we got r squared times cosine of theta plus theta is 2 theta plus i sine of 2 theta. So you might already see where this is going, but let's see what z cubed would be. z cubed would be z times z squared. So you already got z squared over here. Multiply by z again, so we're going to have r times r squared times cosine of 2 theta plus 1 more theta plus i sine of oops, uh, 2 theta plus theta. 
Okay, so altogether that's going to give us r cubed cosine of 3 theta plus i sine of 3 theta. So you can see if you keep doing this, this is what DeMoff's theorem says, z to the nth power is just r to the n, right, because z cubed, r cubed, z squared, r squared, right, r to the n times cosine of n theta plus i sine of n theta. That is DeMoff's theorem. Okay, so make sure you write that down in your notes. The nth power of a complex number in integrated form, shake r to the n because you would have multiplied r by itself n times. And then the even though it's the nth power, we multiply theta by n because you've added theta to itself n times for both the cosine and the sine. Now, where this comes in hand handy is doing things like this. So back when you did this by hand, like with um, with uh, a plus bi just by doing this, so this would mean 1 plus i root 3 times 1 plus i root 3, et cetera, et cetera, right? 1 plus i root 3, you'd have uh, you'd have six of them, right? And you have to foil the first two, foil the next two, foil the next two. You'd be doing so much foil with this, right? Especially if this got to be like the 10th power, right? This is really hard. But if we use DeMoff's theorem, the first thing we have to do is change this to trig form. So let's do that. Let's think about where this is going to be. So we got one plus uh, root three. So it's going to be over here. So one root three is almost a two. So it's going to be like there. Okay, so our R value here, square root of 1 plus 3, it's the square root of 4, it's 2. And theta right here, so this is 1, this is root 3. Pick your favorite trig function, I'm going to use uh, sine maybe. So um, uh, opposite of my hypotenuse, so sine theta is root 3 over 2. Think about that in the first quadrant of the unit circle, that happens at pi over 3. Okay, so theta is pi over 3. So this thing is, um, I'm trying to take, uh, let's see, r is 2 times cosine of pi over 3 plus i sine of pi over 3. Take this whole thing to the 6th power. Okay, so use DeMoff's theorem, 2 to the 6th. Cosine of uh, m theta, so it's going to be 6 times pi over 3 plus i sine of 6 times pi over 3. Now, if you're allowed to leave it in trig form, you're done here. But I'm actually going to do this out. So 2 to the 6 is 64 times cosine of 6 times pi over 3 is 2 pi. Well, cosine of 2 pi is 1 right there. So 1 plus i times sine of 2 pi is 0. So this is 64. Interesting. So I take 1 plus i root 3 to the 6th power, I get 64. What does that mean about 1 plus i root 3? Well, that means that when I take it to the 6th, I get 64. So 1 plus i root 3 is a 6th root of 64. And the rest of today's lesson is really going to be about finding roots. And that's interesting because... Uh, we know, like, the only six roots that we really know of 64 are 2, right? 2 to the 6 is 64, and negative 2 to the 6 is also 64. But what we just showed is that 1 plus i root 3 is also a sixth root of 64. And we actually learned this back when we did uh, synthetic division. If you're solving, uh, like, x to the 6 equals 64, how many solutions should there be to this problem? There should be six. We've only known two forever. So it looks like there are actually some complex ones. So maybe there are two real ones, but maybe four complex solutions to this problem, which is kind of weird to think about. So uh, let's get a definition down. So a complex number a plus bi, I call it v, is an nth root of z if v to the n equals z. So we just showed 1 plus i root 3 to the 6th equals 64. Therefore, 1 plus i root 3 is a 6th root. Of 64. Okay. So this is a special one. If v to the n equals 1, then v is an nth root of unity. Okay, so nth root is just as long as v to the n equals some number z, but if that z is 1, so if you take some number to the nth power and equals 1, it's an nth root of unity. So we've known for a long time at 1 to the n is always 1, right? It doesn't matter what n is. 1, 2, 7, 24, right? As long as you take 1 to any power, it equals 1. Negative 1 to the n is 1 as long as n is even. But they're telling us now, if you're solving the equation like x to the 7th equals 1, there are actually 7 solutions to this, even though the only one that we've always known is 1, because negative 1 to the 7th could be negative 1. So 1 is for sure a solution. 
But then there are six other numbers that must be complex that when you take them to the seventh power, they equal one. Those would be called the seventh roots of unity. Seventh roots of unity. Whatever those seven numbers are, whatever those seven numbers are, are the seventh roots of unity. And six of them are going to be complex, right? If I was solving x to the tenth equals one, there'd be ten numbers. One and negative one will both be on that list, and there'd be five, six, seven, eight more that must be complex. So what we're going to focus on now is how to find those roots, and specifically how to find the roots of unity. So I'm going to give you a scary formula right now, uh, but I'll show you it in a couple of examples. It's really not that bad. So finding nth roots. So if you have a complex number z, and you want, you want the nth roots. So in other words, you want the numbers that when you take them to the nth power, they equal this complex number z. Okay? If it's a real number, then the sine of theta would just be 0. right? So if it's a real number, then this part would just be 0. Uh, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So if you want the nth roots of z, so the nth roots of z, the r part isn't too hard, right? So I need something to take to the nth power that makes r, so it's going to be the nth root of r. Okay? So you do the nth root of r. Now this is where it gets interesting, because if you think about it, when you take something to the nth power, remember you get the first thing to the n, so nth root of r to the n isn't too bad, that's just r, right? But then when I have something in here, so cosine of something, and I need i plus i sine of something. Those somethings, when I multiply them by n, they have to give me theta. Right? When I multiply them by n, they have to give me theta. More specifically, when I take the cosine, it has to give me the same value as cosine of theta. So one thing you might think right away, well, theta over n should work, right? Now stick with me, because I think this is getting a little bit conceptually weird. But theta over n, why would that work? Why would that work? Because when you take this whole thing to the nth power, well, that, uh, that just says nth root of r, Take this to the nth power. What DeMov's theorem says, you take this first thing to the nth power, that's great, it'll turn into r. And then what do you multiply each of these by? You multiply them by n. So the n's will cancel, then you multiply by n, cancel, and you end up with theta. But the problem is that only gives you one root, and we want n of them. We should have n solutions to this. So what happens is, when you think about the unit circle, like let's say that um, theta over n, let's say theta is like pi over 3, like we had in the last example. So theta is pi over 3 right here. So you divide pi over 3 by n. That's going to put you somewhere down here. It's going to chop it into n pieces. It's going to put you somewhere over here. But what happens is if you, divide, um, if you divide a number further along the circle by 5, it might bring you back to uh, pi over 3, which would give you the same cosine value. And you also might be able to get to like um, maybe uh, 5 pi over 3, which would give you the same cosine value. So there are a lot of things that will work. And the way to generate that is by using this formula. So we have nth root of r times cosine of, just write this down for now and just trust me, theta plus 2 pi k divided by n plus i sine of theta plus 2 pi k divided by n, where k is 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1. Okay, so this is how you find the nth, root of z, the nth roots of z, and there are going to be n of them. So just on this list, we have n numbers. Convince yourself we have n numbers on this list. 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n minus 1. It's like 1 through n, but then shifted left 1. Right, And so what they're telling us here is that if you use this little like algorithm, right, this little formula here where you take whatever the theta was, so if it was pi over 3, what happens is if you add 2 pi to pi over 3, would you agree with me that the cosine of pi over 3 plus 2 pi is the same thing as cosine of pi over 3? Think about that on the unit circle. Here's pi over 3. If I add 2 pi to it, it gets me to the same spot. Right? And then if you add 2 pi to it again, it gets me the same spot. Add 2 pi to it again, it gets me the same spot. So no matter how many times, I'm putting a little k there, because no matter how many times you add 2 pi to pi over 3, you're going to get the cosine value to be the same. It's the same deal here. When you multiply by n, so if you take this thing to the nth power, because our whole goal is that when you take this to the nth power, you get z. Right? You take this to the nth power, the n will cancel, because you multiply by n right here, it'll cancel out. And then you'll be left with pi over 3 plus some number of 2 pi's, and that will uh, end up with the same value of cosine and the same value of sine, right? 
Now, some of you might be saying, but that, that seems dumb because, like, you're just going to be getting the same answer over and over again, but you're not. Because you're chopping it into n pieces, you're going to get n distinct different solutions. So let's try this with an example. Getting a little bit too theoretical here. So they want us to find the fourth roots of this z, 81 times cosine pi over 3 plus i sine of pi over 3. So for now, even if, you're j if you don't understand the conceptual, if you're just plugging in numbers, that's okay. Just stick with me for now. So they tell us that's going to be, so the nth roots of z, just using the formula, going to be the nth root, uh, fourth root, so the fourth roots of z, so it should be 4. It's going to be the fourth root <coughs> of 81 times cosine of uh, pi over 3, that's our theta, plus 2 pi k divided by n, which is 4, plus i sine of pi over 3 plus 2 pi k divided by 4, where k is 0, 1, 2, or 3. Okay, So k is all the way up to n minus 1. So 4 is our n, so we go up to 3. So let's just list those out. Fourth root of 81 is 3, right? Because 3 to the fourth is 81. So that's going to be 3. Our first one is 3 times cosine. So the first one, k is 0, so we should have pi over 3 divided by 4, plus i sine of pi over 3 divided by 4. So we simplify that out, that's 3 cosine of pi over 12 plus i sine of pi over 12. Okay, so that's our first one. Now notice we took this to the fourth power. What should happen, if I take this whole thing to the fourth power, what should happen is I should end up with the same thing as z, right? So 3 to the fourth is 81, that checks out. If I multiply pi over 12 by 4, that gives us pi over 3. So far, so good. Okay, so that's our first one. This is, sometimes they call it, um, let's call it x1 for the roots, because we're trying to find x to the fourth equals z. So that's x1. That thing to the fourth definitely works out. So the next one is going to be uh, 3 cosine of pi over 3 plus 2 pi divided by 4 plus i sine of pi over 3 plus 2 pi divided by 4. So what I've done is I've just spun around the circle one more time, and it won't change my answer, but um, it will change this angle in here. So let's think about what that's going to be. So pi over 3 plus 2 pi. Usually I find I have to do some scratch work somewhere. I'll do it up here. Pi over 3 plus 2 pi, that's pi over 3 plus 6 pi over 3. Okay, because we have a common denominator, so I just multiply 2 pi by 3 over 3. So that gives me 7 pi over 3. And then I'm dividing it by 4, so that's going to give me 7 pi over 12. So I have 3 times cosine, 7 pi over 12, plus i sine, 7 pi over 12. Okay, that's x2. So the next one, 3 times cosine of pi over 3, plus this time, so it's going to be 2 pi times 2. So we've done 0, we've done 1, we're now on 2. So we multiply 2 by, by 2, I'm going to get 4 pi. So just keep getting even pi. So we had 0 pi, 2 pi, 4 pi, right? So divide by 4, plus i sine of pi over 3, plus 4 pi over 4. Which is going to be 3 times cosine of, and you might, you're going to start seeing a pattern here, but if you look at this, so pi over 3 plus 4 pi, 4 pi is 12 pi over 3, so plus 1 is 13 pi over 3 divided by 4, so 13 pi over 3 divided by 4, it's going to be 13 pi over 12, so 13 pi over 12 plus i sine of 13 pi over 12, that is x3. Okay. Oh, too far. So now you might be able to guess the last one. Check it out. We got pi over 12, 7 pi over 12, 13 pi over 12. Any guesses what the next one will be? It looks like we're adding 6 pi over 12 to each one. So I think the last one's going to be 3 times cosine of 19 pi over 12 plus i sine of 19 pi over 12. Now I get a lot of questions about this. Like, why can't you keep going? Right, because this is x4. So we have our four fourth roots, our four fourth roots. Any one of these you take to the fourth power, it's going to give you back to z. 
And I'll show you why that is in a second. But first I want to talk about why you can't keep going. If you want one more, what would it be? So if you added 6 pi over 12 one more time, if you added 6 more, you would have 25 pi over 12. Let's think about what that would be on the unit circle. 25 pi over 12. It's frustrating. So 25 pi over 12, think about the unit circle. 24 pi over 12 is 2 pi. Right? This is 24 pi over 12. If you go one more, what would that be equivalent to? Well, you'd be right back to pi over 12, which would get you back to x1. So the having k stop at n minus 1 right here, what that does is it gets you all the roots that you could possibly have. And then if you want one more, it would cycle you back to x1. Okay, so it gets, it's gotten me everything from 0 to 2 pi. We got pi over 12. We got um, 7 pi over 12, which is just past pi over 2. We got uh, 13 pi over 12. And then we got uh, 19 pi over 12, which is going to be down here. Okay, and then if you went around one more time, you'd be back to where we started. So notice all of those values still are within 0 and 2 pi. Even though we keep adding 2 pi because we divide by 4, that gets you all the ones that are going to work out. So let's just check like the third one and make sure that this actually is a root. You take the third one at the fourth power, you get 81. And you have cosine of, if you multiply this by 4, you'd have 13 pi over 3. Let's see what that would be. So uh, 2 pi is how many pi over 3? It's 6 pi over 3. So you'd be at 6 pi over 3 one time around, 12 pi over 3 two times around. So 13 pi over 3 gets you to the exact same place as pi over 3 right here, which is what we need because that's our theta. Right, so 13 pi over 3. So the first one was would get you to pi over 3. That's the first instance. The next one would add 2 pi to that. Then you add 2 pi one more time. Then add 2 pi one more time. That gets you all four roots. Okay, so the answer to this is really these four numbers. Right, those are your four roots. And if you're asked to put this in a plus bi form, you have to actually grab a calculator and do cosine of pi over 12 or i sine of pi over 12. Not too bad though. All right, let's try one that's a little easier. Find the cube roots of negative 1 and plot them on the complex plane. So the weird thing about this, negative 1 is just like a real number, okay? So we have to first put this in the trig form. So you might want to think about where negative 1 would be on the complex plane. Negative 1 would just be right over here. So what that would be, let's think about what that would be. So I have an r value of negative 1, uh, sorry, r value of 1, and a theta value of pi. So I'm going to rewrite this in trig form. You're going to have 1 times cosine pi plus i sine of pi. Okay, so that's my original number z. So now what I want is I want the cube roots of z. So the cube roots of z are going to be the cube root of, uh, of 1. Yeah, cube root of 1, because I, this is best to be up because I was thinking, is r negative 1 or positive 1? It's, it's positive 1. R should always be a, a positive number. So cube root of 1 times uh, cosine of pi plus 2 pi k divided by uh, 3, because we're doing cube roots, plus i sine of pi plus 2 pi k, divided by 3, where k is 0, 1, or 2. Okay, so let's see what that gives us. So first root, x1, is going to be, uh, cube root of 1 is just 1. So we'll have cosine of pi over 3, because k is 0. Uh, plus i sine of pi over 3. Okay, that's our first one. Second root. Second root now is we're going to add 2 pi to pi. So we're going to have 3 pi over 3, which is just pi. So I have 1 times uh, pi plus 2 pi, 3 pi over 3 is pi. So cosine of pi plus i sine of pi. <coughs> Third one. Third one is going to be uh, 1, once again, times cosine of, let's see, pi plus, this time n is 2, so 4 pi, so 5 pi over 3, plus i sine, 5 pi over 3. There we go. There are third roots of negative 1. Now, if you think about it, what should one th third root of negative 1 be? If I have x to the third equals negative 1, what should for sure solve this? I think negative 1 should solve it, right? So negative 1 should be on this list. Let's see if it is. Let's graph them in the complex plane. So first one we have uh, 1 times cosine pi over 3 plus i sine of pi over 3. So pi over 3 is like right here. I'm actually going to kind of make a circle here that has a radius of 1 because all these solutions should be on this circle, right? Because we have a radius of 1 for all of them. So pi over 3 is like right here. Uh, pi is over here. Uh, that is negative 1, right? Because it has no imaginary component. 
and then 5 pi over 3 is right here. So what you'll notice is these actually make a triangle, a perfect equilateral triangle. Because they're evenly spaced out around here, right? We're at, we're at like a third of the circle, um, and then two thirds, and then, uh, well, not, but I gotta think about this. That's a sixth, and then a half, and then, um, yes, a sixth, and then a half, and then I have to think about the math here. This would be what, um, uh, two thirds of the circle? But before you get all the way around, or five six, five six of the circle at that point. It doesn't matter. They're evenly spaced, right? Because you keep adding the two pi, to the top here. So what happens is you end up with an evenly spaced points all the way around the circle. So this actually allows you to find some of these without actually doing a whole lot of math. Some people just find the degree measures and figure out how to do these. I'll do that with the roots of unity, which we're going to do on the next problem. But let's take a look at what would happen if we plotted the points on the last one. So pi over 12, 7 pi over 12, 13 pi over 12, 19 pi over 12. I kind of did it over here, but I'm going to do it again over here. So if we have a circle of radius 3, all the solutions should be on that circle. Oh no. Uh, yeah. So all the solutions should be on. Seriously, I gotta put this somewhere else. No, stop. All right. Uh, I guess I'll do it here. Okay. So we have circle of radius three. Okay, so the circle of radius 3. All the solutions should be on here. So we have uh, radius of 3 times cosine pi over 12. Pi over 12 is half of pi over 6, so it's like right there. 7 pi over 12 is just past 6 pi over 12, so it's like right here. 13 pi over 12 is just past uh, 12 pi over 12, which would be pi, it's right there. And then 19 pi over 12 just past 18 pi over 12, which is right there. If you connect these, what do they make? They make a square. Okay, so you can kind of figure out, if you figure the first one and the second one, you can kind of say, well, they're going to be just past the uh, the compass points each time, right? And if we're looking for fifth roots, what would they make? They'd make a pentagon, right? So you can kind of figure out what the angles are, and then just say, well, I'm going to add 90 degrees every time, or in this case, pi over 2. Okay, all right, let's try one with roots of unity. So uh, if we're trying for uh, the eighth roots of unity, we're looking for the numbers so that x to the eighth is equal to 1. So there are two numbers I think that you know should solve this for sure. 1 to the eighth is 1, right? And negative 1 to the eighth is also 1 because it cancels out the negative, and um, it's an even power, so it'll give you positive 1, right? But the problem is there should be six other numbers that work here. So there are going to be some ones that have complex uh, portions as well. And when we graph them, they should make an octagon, okay? So we'll kind of figure that out as we go. So eighth roots of unity, we know that 1 and negative 1 work. So 1 is over here, negative 1 is over here. And there should be six more, so 3 up above and 3 down below that should work out. So I think you could kind of figure out, if you think about the circle, you could probably just figure this out if you're using degrees. You can do it with radians too, but the fractions get kind of weird. So right at the top should work, right at the bottom should work. And then the 45s. So you know r is 1 for all of these, and then you could just do the 45s all the way around. But let's write them out. Let's do them with degrees, okay, this time. I think that might be a little bit easier. You can also do it with radians, but the fractions just sometimes get a little weird. But you can kind of see what's going on with the circle here if you think about radians as well. So what we're going to have is we're going to have the um, uh, eighth root of 1 times cosine of... Um, it'll be... Uh, sorry, we need to put this in trig form. So 1 in trig form is 1 times cosine of 0 plus i sine of 0, right? Because positive 1 is just right out here, right? It's on a real line. It has not uh, gone up to the i's at all, so it's just right over here. Okay, cosine of 0 is 1. I, a sine of 0 is 0, so this just gives us 1. So we have cosine of 0 plus 2 pi, whoops, 2 pi k divided by 8 plus i sine of 0 plus uh, 2 pi k over 8. And I just realized I said I was going to do this with degrees, but I used 2 pi. I should do 360. I guess you could think about. You can do this either way, right? So if you want to actually use the formula, I'd probably do it in radians, because I think that we already did a couple examples with that. It's kind of the easier way to go. But if you want to use 360k, you can do that. The way I'm actually going to do this, though, I just think, okay, so k is going from 0 to 8, or 7, excuse me, because 1 less than n. So what I would think here is when it's 0, well, I should have uh, just cosine of 0, right? So I would have 
uh, 1 times cosine of 0 plus i sine of 0, right? And what is that? That's just 1, right? That's this value right here. So we've gotten that one. So the next one should be here. So if we do the next one, so that's x1, x2 is going to be uh, 1 times cosine of, so this time it's going to be uh, 360 over 8. So I have 360 into 8 parts, gives you 45, plus i sine of 45. Okay, x3, notice always going to be 1 in the front, so I'm just going to stop writing, writing it, because 1 times anything is just itself. So next one will be cosine of 90, right, if you add one more 360, so 720 over 8 will give you 90 plus i sine of 90. What am I adding every time? I'm just adding 45, right? So we have 0, 45, 90. Next one's going to be uh, 135, cosine 135, plus i sine 135. Next one will be cosine of 180, plus i sine of 180. What's that one? Uh, oh, goodness. Come back. Stick with me. Where are we? One more. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, color back. So we have uh, cosine 180 plus i sine 180. And that's negative 1, right? Because we're right over here. That does not have any imaginary component at all. Okay, so we have x1, x2, x3. This is x4 and x5. Three more to go, but we just keep adding uh, 45 degrees, right? So we have cosine of 225. No, 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 stop. Cosine of 225 plus i sine of 225. That was this one right here. And then the next one would be uh, cosine of 270 plus i sine of 270. 270. Seriously? Oh, sorry guys. So i sine of 270. Come on. Oh. Let's do this. They don't want me to be able to erase anymore. Okay. And then it'll be a cosine of 315 plus i sine of 315. And the last one, and that's everything, right? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Oh my goodness. Okay, so this is x. Seriously. Okay, this is x6, x7, and x8. Whew. Okay, well, this is remarkably frustrating. Sorry, they keep booking me out. But um, the point is, so roots of unity, all you have to do is kind of get this, figure out the pattern, right? So you divide the whole circle into n pieces, and then you're just going to be starting with zero always, because one to the n is always going to be one. And then because we divided it into eight pieces, we're adding 45 degrees every time. If you did this with radians, you would do 2 pi divided by 8. 2 pi divided by 8 is pi over 4. And it makes sense, right? Because 45 degrees is just pi over 4 every time, right? So you would be, the first one would be pi over 4, then it would be pi over 2, then it would be 3 pi over 4, and then uh, 4 pi over 4, which is pi, right? You're just adding pi over 4 every time. And if you connected these dots, you make an octagon. So it takes some practice, but roots of unity are always the same. It always works out the same way. Sorry, we we're dealing with PowerPoint issues at the end there. But that should do it. I uh, love you guys. That's why I'm here. Uh, good luck with Demois Theorem. Have a great day.